Let all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took of the offering of grace he did proper, he saved me, oh praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich as eternal and blessing supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Next, hymn number 249, Glorify Thy Name. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify you 
worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. All right, church, sing it. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you, Brother Ryan. <clears throat> you know, our, our hymns that we sing are steeped, even our praise songs today, don't ever negate that as well, but they are steeped in so much theology that it is, it is just good to be reminded of how great our God truly is. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Acts chapter 18. Uh, we've been going through Paul's journey and uh, seen him go through many different things, seen him go through some persecution, seen him go through some... Uh, times of being kicked out of a synagogue and, and just watching God work right next door and how he brought uh, Crispus and those that were there next to him to the Lord and how he just, everywhere he would go, Paul was being used to the Lord. And every time I think about the Apostle Paul, I think about an ambassador. Now I want y'all to do something tonight. I didn't give Brother Philip an outline tonight because I don't know exactly how it's going to put together. But uh, and I don't ever like to write anything down because my English teacher said you write it down, it's final. I said you can speak it any way you want, but if you write it, that's the end. That's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, so tonight it's going to be a, a a kind of a you fill in the outline. How about that? All right, yeah, everybody got a sheet of paper. I'm going to do like they did in seminary. Take out a half sheet of paper. Don't tear your Bible up. Or if you want to write in the maps, you can do that. But uh, Now, one of my mentors once said, you know, take some notes, put them, and write in your Bible. And some people say, well, that's sacrilege. Don't write in your Bible. But his response to that, he says, you show me a clean Bible, I'll show you a dirty Christian. So I don't know how you want to take that or if you want to, but just write on there, I am an ambassador. That's for you to do, not me. I've already done it. I am an ambassador. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to fill in your job description tonight being an ambassador for Christ. Why? Because that's what we're called to be. Why? Because an ambassador is someone who is a representative. In, in our day, we think of it as ambassadors to nations. Uh, we have ambassadors that will go to Israel. We have ambassadors that will go to Russia and to China and to all these places. And in turn, they send their ambassadors to us. And what do they do? They negotiate and talk about the business of the nation and the leaders that they represent. But when you bring it into a Christian context, the Bible makes it very clear that when we name the name of Christ and we're in this world, our king is not here physically in the sense of him being on this earth, he's in heaven, but one day he's coming back. And what are we supposed to be about doing? We're supposed to be ambassadors of the good news of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be the representatives of who Christ is. As a matter of fact, go over to 2 Corinthians just for a second. 2 Corinthians, Paul talking to these same people that he would come back and visit with and send these letters to. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this. Verse 20, after God had already reconciled the world to him, not holding against us our sin and our trespasses, but has given us that word of reconciliation. Listen to what he says in verse 20. Because of that, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Why? Because we're to share the good news to lost sinners that Jesus saves. And there's coming a king who they're going to give an account to. And they need to be ready to pre be prepared to meet him. When it talks about that ambassador, it's, 
it, it's, it really comes from a word that is rooted in being seasoned or being learned or educated in something. And, and I know it may not seem like it today in our world, but our ambassadors should have some understanding of the places that they're going. You don't want to send someone over to China that has no understanding of the Chinese culture. You don't want to send someone over to Russia that has no understanding of the Russian culture. Why? Because if you do, they could do something that was so offensive that could cause us to be brought into a war that we wouldn't want to fight. All because they weren't seasoned. And so tonight, being an ambassador of God, I want you to be seasoned and be learned into what is your responsibilities for the gospel. Why? Because Paul outlines them here for us in his own life. Him being the ultimate ambassador of the gospel, being a missionary and going out, he gives us through his life what it means to be gospel-driven and an ambassador of Christ. So tonight when you fill this out and you put up there, I am an ambassador, you're going to see what it means then that should be happening in your life. Some actions that should be taking place. But before we get to that, Acts chapter 18, verse 12. Listen to what Luke records. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, and I imagine Paul was going to give a great rebuttal. He was ready to just lay into him with, hey, let me tell you about the fulfiller of the law. Let me tell you about the one who kept all of the law and without sin. And how you crucified him and now he's risen and he's coming again. And he's going to use that same law that you're putting on the necks of his people. And he's going to judge you by that law. I could just see him getting ready to give an account like that. But Gallio, he speaks up. And instead of Paul having to come back, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason what that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, you look to it. For I will be no judge of such matters. And he run them out from the judgment seat. So what did they do? They got mad. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. And after this, Paul tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shaved his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they desired him to tarry longer, a longer time with them, he consented not. But they bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed in Caesarea, and had gone up and saluted the church, he went back down to Antioch, the original church. So what do you see in this passage that makes us want to follow after Paul? Well, here's what made Paul the ultimate ambassador that fulfills these job descriptions that you're going to fill in tonight. Number one, if you're going to be an ambassador to Christ, your first job that Paul shows in his life is simply this. Paul made disciples. Notice so if you go back down to verse 18, it says that he took with him Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife. Who were they? Well, they were the tent makers that Paul come along beside and he said, Hey, while I'm here, instead of my hands being idle, I'm going to work with you. And that will help me provide for what I need as I'm waiting on others to come. So I'm going to work. And as they worked, they began to socialize together. They worked together. They studied together. Why? Because a little bit later on, you're going to see Priscilla and Aquila give a great dissertation about the Holy Spirit of God and the baptism that is to come uh, by knowing Christ and what it meant to be baptized, not just of John, but being baptized of Jesus. Well, how did they get to that point? I mean, could you imagine studying with the Apostle Paul? Could you imagine walking into his class and him saying, Okay, sit down. I've got a word from the Lord. 
That's one thing for you to come and listen to me. Why? Because I'm, I'm doing study on all these men of the past and all these things that the Bible says. But could you imagine sitting in a room with one who actually penned the Word of God? How amazing would that be? But you know what Paul was doing? He was fulfilling the Great Commission. Jesus said, when you go into all the world, you're going to make disciples. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. And then you're going to teach them all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until the very end. Paul was fulfilling the great commission about making disciples. What did Paul do? Well, Paul was going out and he took them with him. You know, one of the greatest things about discipleship I've learned is when you don't go for someone, but you go with someone. I'll never forget, I had a preacher once tell me, he said, you know, I hadn't been saved very long. And he said, I had a guy from the church pick me up and said, hey, you need to go with me out on visitation. Y'all remember going out on visitation? That's discipleship. He said, I didn't know anything about visitation. And he said, I've been reading in the book of Revelation about these scorpions that were going to come and sting men. They had the face of a lion, a scorpion's tail and all this stuff and teeth and all this. And he said, we show up at this guy's house and knock on the door. And they said, we're for such and such church. We're here to share with you the love of Jesus Christ. And here's my little brother. He's just been saved. He wants to tell you about Jesus. And he said, I looked at him and like, what am I supposed to say? Well, just tell him what God's done. He said, man, I don't know about you, but if you don't get right with Jesus, you're going to be stung by scorpions that have lions' faces and teeth, and they're going to eat you up. <laughs> <coughs> He said, that's the best discipleship. Why? He didn't say anything for him. He just let God speak through him. So could you imagine Priscilla and Aquila coming along with Paul and the conversations that they would have? Doesn't the Bible teach us that when we're sitting down, we teach the Word of God? When we're going about our business in the day, we teach the Word of God? When we're eating with friends, we're supposed to share the Word of God? When we're laying down at night, we should be meditating on the Word of God. Why? Because there's a process of discipleship that we will never fully understand. Because here's the reality. You're never too old to learn. And the only time that you're going to end up being perfected in your discipleship is when your faith becomes sight and you see Jesus. We've still got all this area for improvement. But the, he... Took them with him. He taught them. But then here's something that's kind of amazing. There come a time to where he cut the cords and said, okay, now you go. And so if you're an ambassador of Christ, here's the reality. There should be someone that you're walking with. There should be someone you're talking with and teaching. Whether it's in your family, whether it's a friend, whether it's someone else. And then there should be a day to where you finally say, okay, this is far as I'm supposed to go with you. Now go and send them out. We do it in rearing children, do we not? We raise them up. We talk with them. We share with them the things that are good for them, things that are bad for them. We show them the way that is there, there before them. And when they graduate, we say, okay, here's the world. Now go. And if we're to be good ambassadors of Christ, we've got to rear up another generation to carry the mantle of the good news of Jesus Christ. We have to. Why? Because the world is growing increasingly dark. The, the, the imagination of man is growing wicked. It's getting darker. And what are we to do? We're to send people out to be the light in the darkness. So what do you do? You walk with them, you fellowship with them, you bring them in, you teach them, and then you send them out. So to be an ambassador, you should be making, be making disciples, driven by the gospel of Christ. But number two, what should you be doing? Keeping your vows. How do you know that? The Bible says that here that Paul... When he was there, he said, this is what I want you to understand. He said, I'm going to take Priscilla and Aquila with me, and now I've shaved my head. Now, why did he shave his head? Well, it says very clearly, for he had a vow. 
All throughout the Bible, you see these vows that are made. And one that comes to the forefront of my mind is that Nazarite vow. Those who were given of the Lord when they were little to not drink of the vine and, and not to shave their head and to be dedicated only to the Lord. And even if they did cut their hair, they would burn it as an offering back at the temple before the Lord as an offering back to Him. And, and so I think about that Nazarite vow, but that, that I don't believe is what it was talking about. Over in Genesis chapter 28, you can find and you can see Jacob, after he had his struggles and his visions with the Lord, Jacob comes before the Lord and said, Okay, Lord, if this is truly what you want of my life, God, if this is really what you're wanting me to do, and he set up a little rock and he, he, he called that place Bethel, he said, If this is all that you want for me, Lord, then I'm going to make a vow unto you. God, if you will take care of my needs... If you'll provide for me my food, if you'll provide for me the place that I'm supposed to be, if you'll provide for me these things, then Lord, I will make a vow unto you that I will build your temple here and we'll worship you. So what kind of vow did Paul make? Well, it was a vow of action. Why? Because he was all about action. He was all about the action that was to take place. And for whatever vow this had been, he was fulfilling that vow. He was being honest with what he had commended to the Lord. Have you ever made a vow to the Lord? God, if you will do this, then I will do this. Have you ever made that vow? God, if you. Now let me ask you this. How many times has God, but yet we haven't? Maybe we haven't fulfilled it to the extent that we had vowed. Maybe we haven't committed solely to it as much as we should have. Or maybe we committed to it and never surrendered to it. It's kind of amazing. I share this as with some of our Gideons when I'm talking to them about some of the vows and stuff that I've made into the Lord. And one of the things that was kind of interesting is when I went into basic training, they gave us the little military Gideon New Testament. And in there, there's all kinds of little things in the back. It tells you if you're going through suffering, if you're going through pain, going through disbelief, all these things that here's some scriptures that you can reference. Well, before I was preaching, when I was in the military, we were having a rough time toward the end of our training. And I sat down with that little New Testament. And I'll never forget this. Lord... If you'll just get me through this, I'll do whatever you want me to. And I even highlighted a little place in that New Testament. Closed it up. Guess what? I made it through. It's a miracle, but I made it through. I found the fastest way to get through training is to graduate. It's amazing how it works. Do what you're told, you'll graduate. Fast forward to where I'm struggling in with what I knew God was wanting me to do. A preacher constantly walking with me, hammering me around on a basketball court. What's God doing to you? I don't know what God's doing to me, but I know what you're doing to me with those elbows when you throw them. That's what I told him. <laughs> but see, I didn't understand. He was discipling me. He cared enough to ask me, what's God doing? And boy, when that burden became heavy and heavy and heavy, I remember opening up one of my drawers and reaching in and Lo and behold, there was that little New Testament. Picked it up, but I dropped it. And you know, God has a sense of humor. You know where he opened it up to? Right where I had highlighted. He said, are you serious about what you said? Whew. Folks, I don't know about you, but if you've ever made a vow to the Lord and hadn't kept it, and then he comes and starts calling, it gets heavy. Well, long after that, I surrendered to the ministry. But do you have a vow that you haven't fulfilled? You remember in the story of Jonah, if you go back to Jonah, you'll see that there were some men on that ship that made vows to their God that, hey, you've got to get us out of this. We'll do whatever you can if you'll just cause this storm. Well, that didn't work, so they finally cast the lots, and it fell on Jonah, and they threw him overboard. I still think that when they threw him overboard, everything went calm except for that big dark spot that was forming under Jonah. Because he was fixing to go down in a whirlwind of water into that big fish. 
But you know something that's kind of amazing about Jonah chapter 2? Even in the belly of that great fish, Jonah cried out, pleading for mercy, pleading for salvation from what he would say would be the belly of hell itself. I mean, could you imagine being in a fish and it digesting you with its gastric acids for over three days? I don't know about y'all, but I've ran trot lines and had a catfish and had another come up and grab hold of the other one and then you take that one off and there's nothing but the head and just deteriorated flesh. Could you imagine what he was going through, full consciousness, in the middle of that great fish? And you know what he cried out? God, I will vow a vow to you. If you, I will. Boy, it's amazing how faithful God is. But what about our vows? Will we be faithful to complete them? As ambassadors, I challenge you tonight, keep your vows that you make to the Lord and continue to make disciples and be a good ambassador of Christ. But number three, if you're going to be a good ambassador, you've got to do God's will. The Bible says that when they tarried for Paul to stay with them a little bit longer, he said, no, I can't. He said, I'm going to have to say goodbye. He said, I've got to go and be a part of this feast in Jerusalem. So there's some things that I need to do. But I will return again unto you if God wills it. Can I just give you a little advice as an ambassador of Christ? Not every door that opens necessarily is God's will for your life to walk through it. And sometimes the ones that seem the most obvious are the ones you should run from. How do you know that? Well, I know God can open up doors that no man can ever open. He can shut doors that no man can ever open back up. But you know the devil likes to be a charlatan? He likes to be a copycat. Just because it might be a better promotion, it might be better pay, doesn't necessarily mean that that's where God wants you to be because you'll be more concentrated on it than you would be for God taking care of you. I imagine Paul felt like this. He was like, you know what? I would love to stay here. I'd love to stay with God's people and what he's doing. We've seen him do great things. We just sent Priscilla and Aquila out. He's about to do some more things. But he says, but I feel in my spirit that I must go back to Jerusalem. If it's God's will, I'll return. How do we know God's will like Paul did? Where, where does God want us to go? How does God want us to go? What does he want us to be about doing? As ambassadors, we don't have a right to do it our way. We have to respond back to the one that we represent. This is how you find out what God's will is. First of all, you find God's will by affirming it and finding it in the promise of his word. How did Paul know God's word? Because he was in prayer, seeking God over everything. I, I'm getting, I don't ever want to negate a movement of God and what he's doing, but have y'all seen all these videos of Asbury College and all the things that's happening there? If y'all don't, you need to watch it. It's kind of amazing. Uh, that is where some of the old revivals of the Great Awakening took place from, and that's how it all started flourishing. And, and there seems to be a renewed sense of God's presence in, in another generation coming up. And uh, it was kind of amazing because I was listening to the testimony of some of the students that were there, and, and the provost who is over the college, and, and they said, you know, the, we, we were having a chapel, and and the sermon was being preached, and the guy that was preaching the campus revival said, you know, I, I realized I needed to hurry it up. People were starting to, it's a, it's a preacher terminology of, I've lost them. They're going to sleep. Either that or they're agreeing with every thing you're saying, right? He said, I, I just felt like I needed to end it. So he went ahead and ended it, and they had a prayer time, and some from the college stayed back and prayed. Well, Here's something that's unique. Some of the students went to their class and they said they just felt this sense of, I've got to go back. And the professors and things, they were courteous and they were gracious and let them go back. And some of them didn't go back to the chapel per se, but they just stayed in their classrooms. 
And here's the uniqueness. They weren't listening to an eloquent speech. They weren't listening to some great theological dissertation on the salvation of man and all this other stuff. They were praying. There's something about prayer. I don't care how great a speech writer or uh, someone who can bring, get up and is a great orator of the word. If it's not bathed in prayer, it's a dud. You ever had any of those bottle rockets that you get out and you're like, man, I'm fixing to shoot my neighbor with this one. And all of a sudden they go, Psh, pop. Well, that was a dud. That's what it is. It's a dud. But now they're seeing a campus revival that could spark another great awakening of God's presence. Why? Because they're seeking God's will through his word, through prayer. If you want to know God's will for your life, get alone where nobody else is around. Get with God's word. And I got to throw a shout out to Miss Tootie, Miss Willadine. She's, oh my goodness. So I told her, her and Jimmy are uh, just an encourager to me. I think she's going to win that whole hospital in Tupelo to Jesus. If not, she might kill a few nurses. <laughs> and if she's, I know she's probably watching, and she'll say amen. I've already got word of what's going on. But um, she's turning that hospital into her prayer room. Going to the chapel and pray. Folks, there, there's something about somebody that understands the power of prayer. Why? Because in it you'll find what God wants you to do. Because it becomes a point to where you're still before the Lord and then he begins to speak. And oh my goodness. Then you find those promises that God has in his word empowered by prayer and you watch what doors God opens. But there's a second thing you do to find God's will. Surround yourself with the counsel of godly people. Why bounce things off? I met with a wonderful group of, of men uh, after our services this morning. And one of the things I shared with them was simply this. There's going to come some things that I may not have all the answers for. And I'm going to need wise counsel in how to deal with them. And I said, it is a good thing for people to be in prayer in God's word, and then to bounce things off of them. The Bible says there's security in that. There's, there's knowledge and wisdom to be gleaned in the counsel of others. And so when you've got to make decisions, and you're making decisions that are going to affect your future and all these things, ask people, hey, what, what do you think about this? What, what would you say would be the best course of action. Why? Because you may have something spoken into your life that you might see that is totally different from a perspective than you ever saw it, and it may open up just a whole other avenue of how God's about to do something wonderful. And you never saw it because you thought this was the path. So find the counsel of others. And then, most importantly, affirm it by the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God will never, listen to me, will never do anything contrary to the Word of God and the will of God. Because He is God. So the question then has to come up. Are you in God's will? Is there something that you're facing that you don't have the answer for? Get with God. Ask Him. You have not because you ask not. Follow Him. Affirm it by His Spirit. Ask others to walk with you. But then lastly, if you're going to be a good ambassador, make disciples, keep your vows, do God's will. But here's something that's important. Love the church. I think it's kind of amazing that Paul, when he went, it says that when he landed at Caesarea and he had gone up, he saluted 
the church. He embraced them. He, he loved on them. He, he affirmed what was going on. And, and how did he do that? He affirmed it by his presence. His presence being there. You know, I have people a lot of times say, Brother Jeremy, we're going to be there in spirit. We're going to be gone, but we're going to be there in spirit. You can't be in two places, folks. I, I know what you mean, and I understand what But there is something about being in the presence with God's people that is special. If you don't believe that, rewind two years. Folks, I got sick and tired of looking at puppets and fat heads of some people right in here. Why? Because when they started amen and everything I said, I said, I'm losing it or are they going crazy? We, we've got a problem. There's something different about being in a service, and, and I'm not knocking anybody that's at home than watching it from at home. There's something about being in a service that strengthens you through fellowship for the next day. I need you. Because if not, I'm going to be preaching to four. Why? Because I still have a mandate on God to preach the gospel. And if nobody hear me, I know four that's going to listen to me until they get old enough to go on their own. And I hope Miss Rebecca doesn't leave me because if she does, I'm going with her. We need each other. Iron sharpens iron, so the countenance of one man sharpens the other. Embrace the church. Embrace the mission. Embrace the growing. Embrace the, the teaching. Embrace the sending out. And then what will you do? You'll grow it. See, I, I've been in all kinds of seminars and all kinds of seminary teaching that tells you, well, if you want to grow a church, you look at the social economic situation, you look at how, what the population is doing, and here's a place that you can plant a church to where you know you'll grab this percentage. You can start a First Baptist church in any city if it doesn't have one, and you're probably going to draw at least 10% of the population just by the name First Baptist. You know how to grow a church? Love. Simple. How does your family grow? Love. How does your church grow? Love. And the world should know that we are his disciples by the love we have for one another. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Does that mean we're not going to fight? No. <laughs> Some of the greatest love you can share with someone is when you beat the tar out of them. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I mean, we even cry out, say uncle. It's a family term. I mean to my nephews. Can't be to the nieces. Love them. Embrace them. Grow them. Do like we did just a little while ago. When somebody's facing a trial, pray for them. Walk with them. Talk with them. Grow them. So are you an ambassador for Christ tonight? You know your job description now. Continue to make disciples. If, so well, I, I've never made a disciple. Well, somebody's watching you. Could be a kid, could be a grandkid, could be somebody that you work with. And God calls us to go and be disciples and to take them inside and to teach them. Because one day we're to send them out. And I don't believe evangelism is complete until we've discipled someone. Are you being an ambassador of Christ? Are you keeping all those vows that you made to God? Because I promise you, I guarantee you, if you write down all the times he's been faithful to you, you'll never in one time see where he has failed you according to his will. Are you seeking God's will? Are you being an ambassador of Christ? Do you love his church? Only you can answer that test and that call tonight. But will you be an ambassador of Christ? Can I pray for us tonight? Heavenly Father, tonight we come acknowledging your sovereignty over us and acknowledging that, Lord, we have a responsibility to you. 
If we have named the name of Christ, then Lord, we are your ambassadors to a world that is lost. And so many times we don't understand the fullness of what you call us to. But Lord, tonight, from your word, I believe you've laid out what we should be doing. And so Lord, if we are not in that action as Paul was of doing what was according to your will by your way through the word. Then God, let someone come tonight and make things right with you. Let them be seasoned. Let them be learned tonight. That God, that they might represent you in all of your holiness before a world that needs to see Jesus. Jesus, I know you've told us through your word that if there's something that is lacking that we could ask. And Lord, if we need wisdom, you would give wisdom. No repercussions, no questioning of why we need it but Lord in the world that we're living we should all be asking for a heavenly wisdom and so Lord whatever the need is tonight only by your spirit can you reveal it and only by the response of your people can you feel it so God tonight do as only you can in Jesus name amen I'm going to ask you to stand if anyone needs to come the altar is open I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. God is good. Tonight, do not forget, disciple now will be quickly upon us. Five days. Be in prayer for Brother David and the youth committee as they get ready for us to host this and open it up. If you're a youth that's here tonight, invite some friends. If you know someone that needs to attend, get them registered and get them signed up, and I'm sure that they will be blessed. Be in prayer for our band that's coming and be in prayer for Brother Chris Giles as he's coming to speak and uh, that God would use him as a vessel for his glory. How many of you got Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he still in your head? Did you go home and sing it this morning? I know you did. I did too. I went to sleep singing it during lunch. Yep. All hearts clear, minds clear, you ready to meet Jesus. Who are you pulling for in the Super Bowl? Yeah. All the Auburn fans are closet Alabama fans tonight because I know it's because of Jalen. But anyway, <laughs> Brother Brent. 
Yes. All right. We our 39ers has asked us, the ladies that help prepare that and host that. Men, we need some tables to be moved from this facility over to the youth facility. If you can help with that immediately after service, you can go out this way and go over to the closet area. And we got some carriers that can carry them over there. And uh, Brother Brent, can you give them the numbers that we need? Do you remember four long tables, six round? Four long tables and six round ones. If y'all want to pick them up and tote them like Samson, that's fine with me. Uh, but if you could help with that, that would be great. Any other announcements? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for allowing us to uh, be a part of what you're doing. And Lord, I, I know the world has so many concerns about things that are happening around. But Lord, our greatest concern should be for the lost soul that is right in front of us. So Lord, be, be diligent with our hearts, Lord, that we would be able to see the greatest need in a person's life. And that is for them to have a relationship with Jesus. So Lord, if even tonight someone we encounter needs a special word from heaven. Let us be vessels ready to be poured out for your glory. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said,